Okay, good morning, everyone, and uh, welcome to the class on Romans. Thank you, in-person students, for joining us. We want to also welcome the e-learning students who will be listening to our lectures and to our online, uh, to our in-person students um, who are here, our online students as well. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Mm. We'll begin uh, today. We We'll look at study chapter three. We just did a brief introduction and we read chapter three yesterday, but we will um, study it in detail. Can one of you lead us in prayer, please, before we begin? Anyone? Anyone would like to lead us in prayer? Yeah, anyone, you can lead, yeah. Father God, we thank you, Lord. We thank you for this time you have given us, Lord. Thank you for thank you for the time you are given to learn from your word, Lord. Father, we thank you. We, we pray that you open our hearts and Holy Spirit help us to really understand and teach us, Lord. We submit to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you. So um, today we'll be studying chapter 3. So all of you, can you please turn to um, your Bibles, to Romans chapter 3, please. Romans chapter 3. Yeah, we read this uh, chapter yesterday. We, yeah, okay. So in the first part of this chapter, verses 1 to 8, uh, we see what is Paul basically doing, verses 1 to 8. What is he asking there? He's asking some questions. Yes, he's asking some questions. And he is also, is he answering them? Yes, he's answering those questions himself. And he's basically talking, uh, he's asking these questions on what? What aspect? Circumcision, okay. And God's judgment, okay. So, Paul is basically now in this chapter, uh, you know, addressing some common objections that will be raised uh, against God's judgment. Some common objections that people will raise, uh, the, the churches at Rome will raise, the believers will raise after they read chapter 1 and chapter 2, okay? So, he's already thinking in his mind, what are the questions they will ask, okay? So, um, uh, they are, uh, he knows that when they read this, there will be some questions or common objections that they will raise up against God's judgment about, you know, God's uh, will to judge. So he asks some questions himself and he answers them. And these kind of questions which he asks and he answers them himself is called rhetorical questions. Okay. So rhetorical questions are when you Ask the question and you answer it yourself, or the answer is quite evident in the uh, the question itself. Okay, so it's called rhetorical questions. Now, his intent in asking these questions is so that he can get people to think. Okay, he wants them to think because he's he's arguing a case. He's trying to deal with you know judgment and sin and the and faith and righteousness of god and the grace of god so he's asking these questions so that he can they can think so when they think and they are going they are able to answer they will be able to better receive it rather than saying hey this is the truth this is how it is you better receive it okay so he's very smartly you know uh, asking those questions to get them to and he's actually here writing to the Jews. So he's talking all about the Old Testament law. And um, his intent is in asking these questions is that, you know, um, he knows that someone out there will be asking these same similar kind of questions. And um, uh, his intent also in asking is these questions is to address something that they are asking, not to get an answer from them because he himself is going to answer those 
questions okay so he's not asking the questions with an intent to get an answer but he himself is going to answer those questions so paul is basically saying hey i'm addressing some things that you're thinking about i will ask the questions and i will give you the answer okay so as we study this chapter we can just follow paul's thinking as he's presented it here in chapter 3 or we can just follow how he unfolds the truth okay he is bringing out some important truths we can uh, you know follow how he is unfolding those truths now we need to remember that the truth is coming from whom who is the truth coming from yes the holy spirit is coming from god okay so the holy spirit is speaking this truth is saying this truth to the church but it is being written to us by whom paul okay it's, it's been written to us uh, right it's been written to us by paul and paul is using his skill his language and the context that the writer is in okay so in this case the the holy spirit is revealing the truth to the church through apostle paul okay so paul, apostle paul is going to use his language and he's going to be using his words and his thoughts but we need to know that even though it's his thought his language the truth is coming from the holy spirit okay so the holy spirit is saying this and the holy spirit is addressing this to the churches now if you read uh, you know if you read chapter 3 you will see that paul or even if you read the whole of romans you will understand that paul is a very logical thinker okay even the way he presents his argument here in romans is in a very logical way and so he is expressing the truth in this very logical manner to us okay so in this chapter there are two sets of rhetorical questions one set of rhetorical question is about god's judgment and the other set of rhetorical questions is about the jews and the law okay and in between paul sandwiches this with his main conclusion and the key main truths that he presents okay so the main conclusion that he is presenting here is that all have sinned okay and the key truth that he is presenting here is about justification and righteousness is through faith okay so he's saying justification and righteousness is through faith that is the key truth that he is presenting and the main conclusion he is coming to is that all of us have sinned and fallen short of the glory of god okay so with that background with that idea and what also i explained yesterday the background to romans chapter 3 we will begin studying uh, romans chapter 3 so can someone please read verses 1 and 2 please what advantage then has the law or what is the profit of circumcision much in every way chiefly because to them were committed the oracles of god Amen. So he says, "What advantage then has the Jew, or what is the profit of circumcision?" So he starts off by asking the question, which obviously all Jews would ask. Now you need to remember that he's not just asking a question out of the blue over here, right? This is a letter that he is writing, and when you know in letter writing, there is always a, there's always a. flow of thought right from one to the other so you know how he ended chapter 2 right how he ended chapter 2 he's telling the jews what is he telling the jews hey you all are, all have the law but you will also be judged according to the law because you know the law they're not keeping the law and you're breaking the law and you will be judged and he's saying there is no point in saying that you have the law and being proud about it why because you stand condemned because you don't keep the law okay and then he is also ending the chapter 2 by talking about circumcision yes he says circumcision is a physical sign of the covenant but he saying what is the point if you are circumcised and you are not keeping the law it's as good as breaking the covenant it might as well not be circumcised so he saying the gentiles are not circumcised but if they keep the law it's good as 
they are circumcised. Okay, so that is what he has finished writing in chapter two. So he's continuing now. This is a letter, right? Only for us to understand, we have chapter and verse and all of that. But this is basically a letter. So then. He's, Paul is thinking, hey, when the Jews are going to read all this, they're going to say, hey, what is the advantage of us being Jews? There's no advantage of having the law. We're going to be condemned and judged by the law. There is no, <laughs> there is no profit in circumcision. Even if we are circumcised, we are going to be judged. You know, then what is the profit? So he's thinking, you no, know, when people read this, they will ask this question. So what does he say? In verse 2, he says, much in every way, chiefly because of them, we are committed to the oracles of God. So, uh, Paul is saying, hey, you know, all this time you have been told, you Jews have been told, hey, you are a chosen people, a chosen generation from all the nations, from all the people of God. People has God has chosen you and you are blessed. And now, Paul, you are saying we are all sinners, right? And we are all going to be judge the law is of no use the circumcision of the the physical and the covenant you're keeping is of no use so the jews are going to think or ask this question are we of any use now okay or has god forgotten us so he's what is he saying hey no no you it's you you are useful it is profitable for you to be a jew it's not that you are useless it's not that you are unprofitable and so he asked the question and he himself is answering the Question. So he's asking that question in verse 1. What advantage then there is being in a being a Jew? Is there any profit of circumcision? And he's saying, yes, there is, because you were given the oracles of God. You were given the law of God first. So he's asking the question and he himself is answering that question. Okay. So he's saying, yes, there is an advantage because the law of God or the oracles of God were committed to you, were entrusted to you, Jews. First, and yes, you are truly God's people, and God has committed His word to you. So He's uh, basically has been very, I think, uh, harsh with them in talking with them in the latter part of chapter one and chapter two. Now He's kind of, I, as I like I told you, the end of um, uh, last class when I was uh, yesterday when I was introducing the book of Romans, that He's kind of lessening the blow. He's making He really gave them a hard time in this. Uh, 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 the latter part of chapter 1 and chapter 2, now he's trying to be a little more softer or lessening the blow with them. So he's saying, hey, no, no, you are uh, important people, you are useful. Okay. So uh, he's saying that, hey, I'm not totally discrediting the importance of you being a Jew. God has chosen you. He has revealed the laws to you, he's given the oracles. And then uh, we also see later on, he mentions about this in Romans chapter 9, verses 4 and 5. So can somebody please read Romans chapter 9, verses 4 and 5? Because Paul, again, is highlighting there a special place that the Jews had in the nation of Israel. Now, remember when I said in the introduction, we will have a forward look and a backward look. So whatever Paul is saying here, we will also go ahead and look at what he's mentioned in the, the latter part of his uh, letter. And also when we go forward, we will come back and see what he has mentioned in the, uh, in the, the, the chapters before that. So can somebody please read Romans 9, uh, 4 to 5, please. Who are Israelites to whom part in the adoption, the glory, the covenants, the giving of the law, the serving of God and the promises? Of whom are the fathers and from whom, according to the flesh, Christ came. Who is over all the eternally blessed? God. God. Amen. Amen. So what is he saying? Hey, you all are Israelites. You are given the law. You are given the co covenants. You know, you are given, you are the priest. You are given the service of God. That means you are a priest. And uh, if to you, God has given the uh, the promises. For, to you are the forefathers, Abraham, Isaac, and uh, Jacob. And through you came the Messiah in the flesh, Jesus Christ. Okay. So the one who is eternally blessed and over all. So even he, the one, the Messiah who came, who was a Jew. So he's saying, hey, I'm not discrediting that you are useless. There's no use of you. No, because, you know, he's crediting them. All of these things have been given to you. But he's saying, you know, God has 
some things that he wants, the truth that he wants to be made known to you, which you need to understand and you need to know the truth and you need to live by the truth. Okay. So then he goes on to talk about four main questions. And if you look at your notes, those four main questions are uh, given from point um, A to D. And so we will look at those questions and we will also examine Paul's response. So the next question, um, uh, you know, uh, that he says, we'll read it in uh, Romans chapter 3, verses 3 to 4. Can somebody read that, please? So he's asking this question, thinking the mind of the audience who will ask these questions. So before they ask, he knows what he's going to ask. So he's, he's asking it himself. Yeah. For what if some did not believe? Will their unbelief make the faithfulness of God without effect? Certainly not. Indeed, let God be true, but every man a liar, as it is written, that you may be justified in your words and may overcome when you are judged. Amen. So he's, Paul is thinking, the Jews will ask this question. Hey, what if we don't believe? Does it affect all this? Okay, what if we don't believe the uh, if we don't believe the law will it change anything about God? It will not change, right? The law is not going to change anything about God if we as Jews are not going to believe that Jesus is the Messiah. Nothing about God is going to change. Nothing about his law is going to change. Okay. So Paul says, even if you don't believe, it does not change anything about God because God is still faithful. Amen. So he's saying, hey, whether you believe or not, it's not going to change anything about God because God is still faithful. And look at what he says in verse 4. He says, let God be true and every man a liar. Okay. So he's saying somebody not receiving the word or believing the word does not change anything about God. God is still faithful. God is still true. The answer is quite obvious you know, from what he is asking. But for the sake of his audience, he's asking these questions and he himself is answering. And then what does he do to answer that question? He quotes a portion from David's prayer of re repentance that David prays after he had sinned in Psalm 51 verse 4. Can somebody read that please? Psalm 51 verse 4. Psalm 51, verse 4. Against you, you only have I sinned and done this evil in your sight, that you may be found just when you speak and blameless when you judge. Amen. So he's quoting this to again reiterate that our unbelief does not do away with the truth, that we have sinned against God, and God is still just and he's still blameless when he judges us for our sin. Amen. So what he's basically saying here by quoting this verse, he's saying that, you know, hey, your unbelief does not do away with the truth. And what is the truth? The truth is that we, all of us have sinned against God. And when God is judging us, he's doing it with justice, with righteousness and he is blameless. And when he judges our sin, he is doing that with utter or full righteousness or justice and him being blameless. So he answers the second question as well. Then we look at the third question. Okay. Can somebody read that, please? Uh, verses 5 to 7. Verse uh, 5 to 7. But... If our unrighteousness demonstrate the righteousness of God, what shall we say? Is God unjust who inflicts wrath? It's I speak as a man. Certainly not. For then, how will God judge the world? But if the truth of God has in, increased through my lie to his glory, why am I also still ju judged as a sinner? Okay. So he's asking another question that will arise in the mind of his readers. He's saying that the Jews can think like this and ask this question. Hey, as a Jew, if my unrighteousness 
or if my wrong doing is going to show how righteous god is if it shows god as a righteous judge because he is the one who is judging then is god unjust who inflicts wrath okay so he saying what he is basically saying is god unjust by punishing me because i am doing the wrong but when i am doing the wrong it's putting god in good light why is it putting god in good light because it's showing that god is a god who is judging sin it's showing that god is a righteous god is showing that he is a just god then if it's if my unbelief if my sin if my wrong doing is showing god in a good light is showing god that he is righteous he is good he is perfect in punishing me then why is he punishing me he shouldn't punish me you know because my wrong doing my sin is actually showing god in a greater good place so it's actually benefiting god so look at how he is thinking in the and how he is thinking that the jewish people will think on the same lines okay or the the same thing can be presented like this if i am telling a lie as a jew you know and it's god is going to judge me because it, when he judges me he's showing that he is a true god okay then when he judges me because he is the truth and he is true and he's judging my lie it's making god look good it's making god look perfect okay and it's making god look as the god of truth so if it's making god look good if it's making god look right and that he is truth then why should he judge me as a sinner because anyway my sin is actually enhancing the goodness of god or the holiness of god or the righteousness of god or the justification of god okay um so that is what he is basically asking here okay so um look at what uh, the in your notes you have uh, you know uh, uh, an argument that could be made from uh, by judas is carried okay now judas is carried was there he would have made an argument like this he would have said lord if i had not betrayed jesus okay then jesus would not have been crucified okay and people if jesus would not have been crucified people would not be saved of their sins so my showing jesus as the one who is a messiah you know then why am i being judged for betraying christ okay he's saying judas was saying yes i know i betrayed jesus but you know that betrayal brought about so much of good jesus was arrested <laughs> he was crucified and because of his crucifixion many people were saved from their sins or humanity was saved from their sins then why should you judge me for betraying jesus or why should you call me as a betrayer okay because you used whatever i have done you used it for the good so he's saying if i hadn't done what i did jesus would not have gone to the cross at all people would not be saved and all that <laughs> scriptures would have told would not be fulfilled okay then judas would have asked why are you judging me at all okay why you want to judge me okay so that is the argument here okay the jews are saying our unrighteousness is revealing the righteousness of god our sin is revealing the that god is a righteous judge a lie is revealing that god is truth okay it's revealing the truthfulness of god and the wrong that we are doing is actually showing god as good and great then the jews are saying why do you want to judge us <laughs> you know for the wrong that we are doing okay so we'll uh, that is the the third question that he asked and we'll move on okay uh, we look at all of this in detail later on okay so the next one romans chapter 3 verse 8 can somebody read that please and why not say let us do evil that could make come as we as slanderously reported and as some affirm that we say their condemnation is just yeah so he saying that some people are falsely accusing paul that he's teaching people okay 
What is he teaching people? He's telling people, hey, let us do evil or that good may come or that God can be glorified. So some people are, Paul has heard this, that he's accusing them, that Paul is teaching people that, you know, hey, Paul is saying do evil or uh, so that good may come or that God can be glorified. Okay. So Paul in those days had to deal with this kind of false reports about him and his ministry. So Paul is opening up here. So look at what Paul's response is to that. He says in verse 6, can somebody read verse 6, please? Certainly not. For then how will God judge the world? Yes. Yeah, so he's saying, you know, certainly not. Okay. How will uh, God judge the world? world. So, you know, he's saying, certainly not. God is not an unjust God. Okay. He's not going to judge the world. Okay. Uh, but he's going to, uh, you know, he's judging our deeds. Okay. So that is what he is saying. So Paul's res response in verse 6, he says, does God want us to do evil so that he can look good? Or does God want us to speak lies so that, you know, he can look as though he's the God of truth? Does God want us to commit unrighteousness so that his righteousness can be shown? So what is he saying? Certainly not. God is not an unjust God. He's going to judge the world, but he's going to judge our deeds. So what should be our response to what Judas would have thought and what we paraphrase about Judas or what we spoke about his thinking? What do you think? You know, our response should be to Judas. What do you think? You understood, right, what Judas' thought was, or we just paraphrase what he would be thinking, what he would be saying. So what do you think should be our response to Ju Judas? Yes, God used your wickedness. You know, your greed for money. God used your wickedness. God used your betrayal. And he turned it around for good. But it was still whose wickedness? Judas' wickedness. It was still his evil plans. Okay. So was there any good purpose or motive in what Judas was doing? No. There was no good purpose. There was no good motive in his heart. And remember what he, Paul writes in Romans chapter 2, he says we will be judged on what? Our motives, our desires, okay, our passions, our desires and our thoughts, what we, the, our deeds, what we are doing, okay. So he says we will be judged on three counts, our des deeds, our desires and our motives. So our, what will be our response to Judas? Hey, was your deed right? No, it was evil. Was your motives right? No, your motives was to get money, not to, you know, uh, to uh, help Jesus do what he was supposed to do. What was his desire? Money. Yes, his desire was money to get the riches and to live a happy, you know, uh, life with that money that he gets. Okay. So, all of that on those, all of those counts, it was everything was wicked, evil, and unjust and not right. So there was no good, pure motives in his heart. So it's no credit to you that God brought you, you know, it is no credit to Judas that God brought out good out of that evil. Okay. Yes, God brought out good out of that evil, but the credit does not go to you for doing that evil. You can't take credit and say, oh, because I did that, Jesus was betrayed and he was crucified. And that's how the sins of all mankind was paid for. Okay. So what we can tell Judas is, hey, you stand guilty before God. Right? You stand guilty before God. So, you know, Judas will be judged by God on all of those three counts, his deeds, his desires, and his motives. His deed was the act of betrayal. He betrayed his friend and his master. His desire was for those 30 pieces of silver. And his motive was what? To please the chief priest rather than to stay faithful to his master, to his friend, his master, his teacher who had trained him this last past three 
years. So even though God brings out something good out of the wrong, as in Judas's case, you know, God's purpose was carried out, yet uh, Judas's sin will be judged. Okay. So God is a righteous judge. He will not overlook the wrong that we have done because we can't say that, hey, our wrong has brought about something good. Okay. The wrong that we did help somebody, it brought about some good. So we can't say, hey, my lie, size, my lie saved somebody. Okay. Or we can't say, hey, I took the bribe, but I took that bribe and I didn't take any money. I put it as tithe in the church or I put it as I gave it to an orphanage. So the orphanage was helped. We can't justify our actions. The bribe was a bribe. It's a, it's a, a sin. You would have tried to do something good about it. That's no way going to please the heart of God. He's going to judge your son. Your lie has saved somebody, but a lie is a lie. For God, there is no gray shade. Either black or it is either white. Are you all able to understand? Yes? Yeah? Sometimes we can also come to that place like this, right? Like Judas, like the Jews, saying that if our sin, if our unbelief, if our unrighteousness is going to show God as you know righteous and good, then why is he judging us for our sin? Okay. So the Apostle Paul, uh, you know, actually is not using this time to respond to his slander, uh, to the, the Jew slander or the false report about him, but he's simply just stating that their condemnation is just. Okay. Which means he's essentially leaving it to God to handle such people, knowing that God will judge them righteously okay so it's an important lesson for us to learn here how to deal with people who slander us who speak evil of us who falsely accuse us or falsely accuse our, our life our ministry you know what should we do let god deal with them okay let god deal with them because when god deals with them he will deal with it in a righteous way there's no partiality. You will deal with them according to the truth. And that will not cause any kind of disturbance in the ministry. Because if you deal with such people, what will happen? It will cause a lot of strife. It will not cause a lot of division. Now, this person who is hurt will go and tell B. B will say C. C will tell D. And there's a lot of strife. There's a lot of division in the church. So what you need to do as wise as uh, you know, a leader is, you know, you don't have time to fight all this because our, our, our uh, Paul says a fight is not against flesh and blood, against principalities. You can't fight Satan who is using them to do all of these things. So the best thing is to do is to let God deal with them. And I've seen that even in the, the ministry, you know, dealing with teams and with people, with so many people sometimes, I know what they're doing behind my back. And I'm just telling God, God, I don't have the time and I don't have the energy to fight them. I'm not somebody who can argue back and fight back. I, I can't just think what to say. And then I would think, oh, I should have said this, I should have said that. But at that moment, nothing comes, it's just blank, you know. So I just let God fight and I've seen how God fights my battles. And when God fights the battle, I've seen him, he does it so neatly, he does it so cleanly that the whole ministry setup is not affected. One person will leave and go, but the others will stay, the ministry will stay, the ministry will go on, everything is intact. So here also we see that Paul is not using this letter or the space to, you know, get back and respond to his slanderers and those who are spreading a false report against him. But he's just simply stating that their condemnation is just. That means God is a God who is God of justice and righteousness. He's the one who will judge and he will judge in righteousness and he's the one who will condemn. So something that we can learn in ministry, something that we can learn as, you know, all of you are in the final year and, you know, you are in the <clears throat> in leaders and all of you online students, e-learning students, you know, all of you who are in ministry, uh, pastoring churches, or also handling your business or in the workspace, you can just do this. Let God deal with them. Okay. We'll move on. Any questions so far? Any questions? Okay. 
Then we'll move on to verses um, uh, nine to you know following. So can somebody read nine, please? He asked another question there in verse nine. Some uh, Roman three nine. What then are we better than they? Not at all, for we have previously changed both Jews charged. and charged uh, both Jews and Greeks that they are all under sin. Yes. So what is uh, the, another question that the Jews will think in their mind when they're reading uh, Paul's letter or Paul's letters being read to them? What is the question? Are the Gentiles better than us Jews? See? So that will be a question that will raise up. Yes or no? Yes or no? I mean, it's, it's, so, it's so nice to see, like, you know, Paul is thinking from their mind because he's a Jew himself, right? So he's, he's thinking of Jews who say, are the Jews better than the Gentiles or are the Gentiles better than the Jews? So are the Jews better than the Gentiles? So he's saying, what is the answer? No, the Jews are not better than the Gentiles. Why? Yes, all have sinned or all are under sin, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And so that is what he brings us to the main conclusion that all of us have sinned. And that is what he's mentioning in Romans chapter 3, verses 10 to 20. Okay, so we'll just uh, look at that whole scripture passage. So can somebody please read uh, verses 10 to verse 20, please? As it is written, there is none righteous, righteous, no, not one. There is none who understand, there is none who seeks after God. They have all gone out of the way. They have together become unprofitable. There is none who does good, no, not one. Their throat is an open tomb. With their tongues, they have practiced deceit, poison of as is under their lips, whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Destruction and my misery are in their ways, and they, and the way of peace they have not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes, says to those. Now we know that whatever the law says, it says to those who are under the law that every mouth may be stopped and all the world may become guilty before God. Therefore, by the seeds of the law, no flesh will be justified in his sight. For by the law is the knowledge of sin. Amen. Okay. So he's saying, you know, hey, you Jews, you know, you are special to God because you have the law. But yet, even if you have the law, we are all under sin. Okay, so in uh, in this chapter, in verses 10 to 12, he's quoting from Psalms chapter 14, verses 1 to 3, and Psalms chapter 53, verses 1 to 3. So can someone read Psalm 14, 1 to 3, and someone else can read Psalm 53, 1 to 3, please? Psalm 14, 1 to 3. The fool has said in his heart, there is no God. They are corrupt. They have done abominable words, works. There is none who does good. The Lord looks down from heaven upon the children of men to see if there are any who understand, who seek God. They have all turned aside. They have together become corrupt. There is none who does good. No, no not one. Read Psalm 53, verse 1 to 3. Please. The fool has said in his heart, There is no God. They are corrupt and have done abominable iniquity. There is no one who does good. God looks down from heaven upon the children of men to see if there are any who understand, who seek God. Every one of them has turned aside. They have together become corrupt. There is no one who does good. No, not one. Okay, so that is what he is quoting here from uh, in, uh, in verses 10 to 12. So what is he basically saying? That no one is righteous. And what else is he saying? No one is good. 
and also no one is seeking after God. Okay, so when he's quoting the Psalms, he's saying that hey, people are speaking evil. Okay, what the Psalmists are saying, the people are speaking evil, they are practicing evil, they're going after destruction, and there is no fear of God in them. So what he's saying is that whether we are talking about Jews or whether we're talking about Gentiles, all of us are like this. How are we all? None of us are righteous and we are all sinful in the way we think, in the way we do things, in the way that we react. And none of us are, you know, seeking after God. We're all speaking evil, we are practicing evil, and there is no fear of God in us. And so that is what he is uh, mentioning here. In verses 19 and 20, he's saying, so Jews, you have the law, but you will be judged by the law. And he says, but ultimately all the world stands guilty before God. So whether you have the law or you don't have the law, all of us are standing guilty before God because, you know, we are, whether you have the law, you cannot keep the law, we're breaking the law and we are all sinful. We have, you know, the inclination to sin and none of us are righteous before um, God. And he's also telling the Jews, don't think that, you know, by doing the deeds of the law, by following the law, speaking the law, by teaching the law, reading the law, and also by, you know, just practicing some of the things in the law, that you can ever be justified. So the Jews thought they can be justified by keeping the law. And so that is what Paul is taking them to. He's taking them to a point where he's saying that it's the law that is not going to make us righteous. It's the law that is not going to justify us, but it is by grace through faith. So he's building up the entire thing to that. So he says, by keeping the law, you can never be justified. Why? Why can't you not be justified by keeping the law? He talks about this in, in more in detail in chapter 6 and onwards. Because he says, what does the law do? What does the law do? Is a teacher. It exposes our sin. Okay? When God gave the law to the people, that is when they knew, knew hey, we have gone against God. Or we have transgressed. Or we have broken something. Or we have not done what is right before God. So he's saying the law only exposes our sin. The law only shows us that we are sinful. Okay. But the law is not something that justifies us or makes us righteous. Okay. So Paul is writing this to the church, and the church needs to understand that all of us have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. So this is how we are before. God. This is the truth. This is how we are before God. So through all that what Paul has written so far, now he is going to present the solution. Okay. What has he written? We are all sinners. We have all broken the law. We all stand guilty before God, you know, and we are, uh, you know, in a rightful place of receiving his judgment. But he's saying there is a solution. And God is God is going is giving us the solution. God is the solution. So He's giving us He's giving this solution. So Paul is maintaining something. He's maintaining that God, even though He's righteous, you know, He's going to provide a solution for our problem. He's providing a solution for our predicament. Yes, He's a righteous judge. He will judge us sin. Okay, but he's also a God who is going to provide a solution for us. The solution that we are in, God is going to provide a solution for our predicament. Okay, all of you are able to understand? Yes, he's, God is going to fix things. He's going to clear up the mess. He is going to remove us from that corner that we are in, that we are cornered in, and he is going to give us the solution. So then he talks about the key truth. Remember I said this chapter presents the key truth. What is the key truth? Yeah, what is the key solution or the key truth? Salvation to Jesus. What did I mention in the beginning of the class? Justification and righteousness through faith. Okay, so now he starts basically presenting the gospel. Okay, so for verses 21, 
he is presenting the gospel to us. So you see how he's built up the case? Are you all able to see that? No, in a very nice way, he is beautifully built up the case. And now he's coming to a place where he's saying, hey, the law cannot save you. The law cannot make you righteous and just. Then what can make you uh, righteous and just before God? So he's built it up and he is now going to present the gospel. He's saying God is going to give us the solution. He's saying that it's justification and righteousness to faith. So all of you are able to understand? Yes? No? Yes? Okay. Okay, so um, we look at verses 21 to 26. So can somebody please read verses 21 to 26, please? Verse 21. But now the righteousness of God, apart from the law, is revealed, being witnessed by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness of God, through faith in Jesus Christ, to all and on all who believe, for there is no difference. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, being justified freely by his grace through the through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God set forth as a propitiation by his blood through faith to demonstrate his righteousness, because in his forbearance God has passed over the sins that were previously committed to demonstrate at the present time his righteousness, that he might be justified and the justifier of one who has faith in Jesus. Amen. So here, what do we see the uh, some of the words repeated over and over again? What are some of the words repeated over and over again here? Just. What else? Righteousness. Yes. What else? Justified. Just, justifier, righteousness, yes, justified. So all of these words are given here. So what does this words just, justify, justification, justifier, justly, righteous, righteousness, righteously, what does it mean? Does it all mean the same thing? Just, justifier, justification, righteous, righteously, righteousness. Does it all mean the same thing? Yes, it all means the ba the same thing because it all comes from the same, uh, you know, Greek root word, which simply means doing what is right or means what is right. So when you say just, justifier, uh, justified, righteous, uh, righteously, righteousness, all means the same thing, what is right. So what is righteousness? Huh? Righteousness means? Yeah, go ahead. It's okay. When, for being holy before God, okay? What does righteousness mean? Right standing before God, okay? It basically means being right in the act of doing what is right and just before God, okay? It's a state of being right or the act of doing what is right and just righteousness also means righteousness is being in a state that is approved and acceptable to God. Okay, so it's being in a state that is also being uh, approved and acceptable to God. And even if you look at righteousness elsewhere, it's it's also doing what is approved and acceptable to God. Okay, so I'll repeat that again. Righteousness is the state of being right or the act of doing what is right and just. Okay, righteousness is being in a state that is approved and acceptable uh, to God. Righteousness also means doing what is approved and acceptable to God. Okay, so, oh, we'll have to stop here. Okay, we'll stop here. Um, sometimes when you're teaching, you don't see the time till the bell goes. Okay, we'll stop here and uh, we'll continue. Uh, next week. Okay. Thank you everyone for joining class. Anyone has any questions before we leave? You can unmute your mics and we can hear you online students. Anyone has any questions? No questions? Okay. Thank you. Then we will meet uh, next class. Thank you everybody. Have a blessed day ahead. God bless. Thank you.